Today we're going to be studying out Luke chapter 19. The title of the lesson is The Time of God's Coming. This is an exciting passage because we're coming to the end of the journey section in the book of Luke. It, of course, starts in chapter 9 and goes to chapter 19, verse 44. And, of course, it's Luke's way of saying that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen, church? Let's go to Luke chapter 19. Verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, so he's on his way to Jerusalem. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead, climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said, Lord, look, Lord, here and I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. She said to him, today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Our first point, a wondrous gift. Right here, Jesus is entering through Jericho. And the crowds are amazing. They all want to see the most famous preacher in all of Israel. And the preacher is making his way to the great city of David, Jerusalem. They're lining the streets of Jericho. And there is this one guy. His name, Zacchaeus, and the Bible says that he was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. That kind of goes with being chief tax collector. (laughs) And, And he wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to see Jesus really badly. But he had a challenge. He was short. And the crowds, the crowds were so big he couldn't see. But this dude was creative. He runs on ahead of Jesus and the disciples. And the Bible says he, he climbs a sycamore picture. Now, now, if we were to make this into a movie, I kind of picture Danny DeVito right about here. <laughs> and you got to understand, this is the chief tax. I mean, he is dressed out in his best toga. <laughs> and here he is with a little bit of a beer gut, you know, trying to climb up the sycamore <laughs> tree. And he just kind of plops up there. You know what I'm talking about? And so here comes Jesus and the procession of the disciples along. And Jesus looks up. <laughs> And here's this guy, the chief tax collector of the city, perched up there. And he says, says, Zacchaeus. See, Jesus knows everybody's name. Amen, guys? Zacchaeus, come down. (laughs) You can just imagine all the people breaking out in laughter. And so he kind of waddles down the tree, you know. And then Jesus says, I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. You know, if you ever need a Bible passage to give you an excuse to invite yourself over to someone's house, this is it. (laughs) So college students, you now can open this passage to the older members right here and say, hey, I've got to come over to your house today for dinner. (laughs) Now, Luke tries to point out The throngs of people that are in adoration of Jesus and the miracles. But then in verse 7, he says, all the people saw this. They began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. They still didn't get it. That the kingdom of God was for sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes. Jesus goes to Zacchaeus' home, and most likely in a dinner setting, Jesus talks to him. And though we don't have the record of the talk, we have Zacchaeus' response, his eureka moment. He says, look, Lord, here now I give half my possessions to the poor. Such a contrast to the rich young ruler, would you not say? 
And, it, and if I've cheated, well, no, hold on. You're a tax collector. You're, 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 you're doomed right here. <laughs> if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. That's kind of interesting because if you accidentally take something of somebody or you break something, the Old Testament in Leviticus chapter 5 says that you would pay back a 20% interest on it. But if you stole something purposely, you have to pay it back four or five times. Exodus chapter 22. And also very interesting, it was Roman law that if you stole something, restitution was four times. And so here he stands up, this eureka moment. And Jesus, I, I can't help but kind of picture Jesus just smiling right here. <laughs> and saying, today, salvation has come to this house. Because this man, too, is the son of Abraham. Now, that's a bit redundant. This is a total Jewish crowd. But in effect, Jesus is talking a little bit like us when we talk about being a sold-out disciple. You see, in some ways, being sold out and being a disciple are synonymous in the Bible. But sadly, in our day and age, it's become fuzzy. And disciple can mean anybody, anything from someone that stops by church on Sunday to someone that's really doing the work of the Lord. And right here, Jesus is saying, well, here is a true son of Abraham. Here is a true Jew. Salvation has come to this house. And then Jesus says, this is what I'm all about. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. That was Jesus' mission. That was his purpose. If we're followers of Jesus, that must be our mission. That must be our purpose. Jesus' physical body is no longer with us, but his spirit is with his spiritual body, the church. And so the body of Christ, mission and purpose, the mission and the purpose of the church is to seek and save the lost. Are you with me here, church? <laughs> what a wondrous gift. What a, what a special. You know, um, this week, Friday to be exact, was Elena's 35th spiritual birthday. <laughs> Elena was baptized back in 1973, 17 years old, right before she started college. And it was kind of, it was kind of cool because uh, I was, I was, I, I remember that it was her birthday. And so I was, I was sitting on the couch, having pretty much done my quiet time, and I, and I was just about ready to say, happy birthday. And she comes, and goes, you know, it's my 35th spiritual birthday. <laughs> and there's this, 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 this Zacchaeus-like radiance. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was incredible. I go, yeah, babe, that, that, that's awesome. See, I remember back 35 years ago. To a very pretty college girl to be, who in the world's eyes had it all. Homecoming queen, star tennis player, ranked in Florida. Had a boyfriend that was president of the student body. In the eyes of the world, what more could a 17-year-old girl want? But Elena saw the Lord. She says, that's what I want. It's my salvation. And, you know, when you think about it, salvation is one of the most fascinating things to contemplate. To think that a being could be and dwell in the presence of God for eternity. You know, that's why we're so fascinated when someone shares up here and we see them go under the water. Knowing it's not just a symbol, but knowing that by faith, they're coming in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ and are rising a new creation. All their sins are gone and they've got the Holy Spirit to live the Christian life. That's a miracle. But, but isn't it interesting how we sometimes, like Moses coming down from the mountain, allow that radiance to fade. And sometimes we need that spiritual birthday to remind us, it's my 35th spiritual birthday. How you doing today? 
Are you radiant? Are you fascinated by your salvation? Just in awe of it, just tingling all over. See, that's, that's how Zacchaeus was. You know, it was, it was shocking just the other day to, to read about Bernie Mac dying at 50 years old. Wow. I consider that young. You know, when you start hearing about people dying that are younger than you, you go, wow. Thank God I'm saved. You know, we have a lot of people in here that have been studying for a long time. And you still don't get it. That no matter what you have in the world, it's nothing compared to having a personal relationship with God. And having that salvation. And that radiance. The very fact that you walk with God. Let's move on. <laughs> this next section, at first glance, a lot of people say, oh, I, I know this parable. It's just like the parable of the talents. No, 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 no. The parable of the minus is actually quite different. A lot of similar words are said, but it's a very different setting that's spoken in. And as a matter of fact, it's a very challenging, very challenging parable and fits perfectly with what's happening because Luke writes in verse 11, while they were listening to this. So, we see there at the dinner, Zacchaeus has had his eureka moment. Jesus has said, you are true, son of Abraham, and that's why I've come, to seek and save the lost. So, with the theme of salvation now, Jesus tells this parable. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, sir, your, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, the master replied, because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, sir, your, your miners earned five more. The master replied, you take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, mm, sir, here's your mina. I, I've kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you're, you're a hard man. You take out what you did not put in, and you reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I'm a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take this mina away from him and give it to the one with ten minas. Sir, they said, he, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. But those any of mine, who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. That was a nice, warm, fuzzy ending to that, 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 that parable right there. This, this was hard line right here. And, and we know this has all got something to do with salvation. Our second point is the ongoing challenge. Very interestingly, this parable has its roots in history. In the day, in the Roman Empire, whenever a man would ascend to kingship in one of the provinces or one of the countries that was in the Roman Empire, he would make the trek all the way to Rome to get the approval of the emperor for that particular position. And so it was in about 4 BC when Herod the Great died. Now Herod the Great, he's the one that murdered all the babies in Jesus' time. He died, and his very unpopular son was to be the king. He was unpopular because shortly before King Herod died, his son had killed 3,000 Jews on the Passover, trying to put down a rebellion. He was hated. 
And so very interestingly, King Herod dies. And so Archelaus takes off to go to Rome. Now we're talking, that's quite a trip in those days. It's a long time. Well, the Jews got together, and history tells us they sent a delegation of 50 men. They were so hateful of Archelaus. They sent a, a group of 50 men to the emperor to try to protest this guy taking over as king. Well, bottom line, he comes back as king. Amen? Okay. That's where the story comes from. So let's delve into the actual parable itself. We see right here, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed a king, and then to return. Okay, well, now we understand that. And, of course, this noble uh, birth man is, figuratively speaking, Jesus. So he's going away, but he's going to return. Now, why, why all this? Because the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. And we know that there's going to be a long time before Jesus' second coming. Are you with me right here? So he begins to tell this story. And he says, so this man of noble birth calls together ten of his servants. And to each of the ten servants, he gives a mina. Now, a mina is about three months of wages. Is that cranking or not? Would you like to have a mina today? <laughs> And you see, these guys didn't do anything to get their mina. It was given to them free. So the mina represents their salvation. And he says to them, put this money to work. Put your mina to work. Until I come back. Well, then he says, his subjects hated him, sent a delegation saying, we don't want the man to be our king. But then the Bible says, he was made king, however, and returned home. Now, when the nobleman returns home, there's accountability right here. And so each of the servants comes before the nobleman. The first guy comes, and he says, hey, Jesus, I, I, I took your mina, and I earned ten more. The nobleman says, well done, good and faithful servant. Because you've been trustworthy in very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second one comes, this man. I took your mind, and I got five more. I mean, this was cranking. This was awesome. Amen, guys? Then the third guy comes, and he says, you know, uh, I, I, I didn't lose your mind. I just laid it away for a while. But bottom line, I didn't do anything with it. And, of course, Jesus calls him wicked and even challenges, well, why didn't you just then put away on interest? Let's think about these. We find right here something that's very important for us to understand that the Bible, I think, speaks very clearly on is the paradox of salvation and works. You cannot work to be saved. There's no amount of church service you can go to. There's no matter amount of good deeds you can do. There's no matter of number of people you can baptize to earn your salvation. It is given to you free, and you must humble yourself to receive it. But you are saved to work. You are saved to work. Once you get the mina, once you get your salvation, you got to do something with it. You got to get some other salvations going. Are you with me right here? So we understand, first of all, the ongoing challenge that grace demands a response. Grace demands a response. It is unacceptable to God. Not to respond to his grace and help others receive their salvation. As a matter of fact, we see in this particular passage, a very interesting situation. Is that not only does grace demand a response, but we also now understand another concept. You must earn the right to lead. Jesus says you start with a little, you prove yourself faithful with a little, and then God gives you a lot. You know, there are a lot of people who want to start with a lot. Hey, look at all my talent. That doesn't count with God. In, in the spiritual world, you start with a little, and then God gives you a lot. You know, I really couldn't help but to think about uh, our dear brother DJ. I don't know about you. I already miss him. And I still remember 
when uh, DJ first came to Portland, his girlfriend at that time, Casey, was already co-leading the campus ministry. And I think when DJ came, he was expecting, okay, I'm going to lead with Kate. That, that wasn't the case. He started out as my assistant Bible talk leader. Well, geez. But you know, he proved himself faithful. I still remember the Bible talk. We had 33 college students crammed in a little tiny uh, room there, dorm room. He learned. He proved himself faithful. He then led his own Bible talk. Then he became the campus minister. Then he came down here and led the Hollywood region. And because he proved himself faithful in a little, now he's leading the New York church. <laughs> See, that's how God raises people up. It was neat talking to DJ just uh, yesterday. I said, well, how, how are things going? He said, oh, boy, it's going amazingly. All but three of the people on our 20-man mission team have jobs. Is that incredible? I mean, in one week, almost everybody has jobs. I said, well, well how, how, how's the rest going? Oh, bro, it is going so awesome. I said, well, what are you guys doing? He said, bro, we're going to start a campaign starting this Sunday and all through next week. I said, oh, yeah, tell me more about it. He says, well, we're calling it Operation Love Bomb. <laughs> and what we're going to do is we're going to go to one campus on Monday. We're going to go to NYU. And then uh, Tuesday, we're going to go to Columbia. And then Wednesday, we're going to go to Brooklyn College and so on down the line. He says, we are just going to love bomb these campuses. We're going to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And you know, I couldn't help but think as he, as he was talking, just the excitement that was there. The sense of joy that he had to think that he was going to be able to multiply his money into other people. You know something? If anyone's ever led someone to Christ, you never have to tell them, hey, you need to get into a study. Because once, once you study with someone and you see the fascinating salvation accepted by someone, you go, that's so awesome. And they've changed so much. This is incredible. And so I've got to ask you, how many, how many studies did you, you get into this week? Or were you just so busy that you didn't get into any studies? We, we've got to really take this very seriously right here. God is saying we must respond to his grace. We must put our salvation to work. Are you with me here? Our third point is that reckoning will come. There is a sense of accountability in this parable and a sense of judgment. For most in the workplace, you understand accountability. You know, the boss has a little accountability going, does he not? <laughs> and, of course, college students understand accountability. Those are called quizzes and tests and final exams. And we all understand the value of accountability. Because if we're not held accountable, most of us give into laziness and don't do what we're supposed to do. Accountability, though, can be very positive. Like for the first two guys right here, it was incredibly positive. Jesus comes and says, how'd it go? Oh, it was awesome. I got ten more minus. I got five more minus. It's incredible, Jesus. He goes, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. Now, the third guy, he didn't like the accountability too much. Isn't it interesting? Why don't people like accountability? It's because they're being held accountable for something they know they should have done. And they feel guilty. Sometimes they get mad and rebellious. You know, I, I don't think I'll, I'll, I'll soon forget when uh, Josh Korlick was, was baptized just a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and I got to say this. I mean, th this, this is a young man who was helping Nick all day on Thursday to move in his house. Here he is, baby Christian. He's already rolling up his sleeves and serving the Lord and the brothers. Amen? Amen. But I'll never, never forget Josh getting on up here and sharing about his life before he was baptized. And he says something to the effect, he says, you know something? I have a very 
addictive personality. I've been addicted to drugs, women, alcohol, money, and pornography. He says, I am just so appreciative of Nick and Cam because they've been in my life and, and every day they would ask me, Josh, how's it going? And I've begun to live a victorious life. And one of the things that was shared is the fact that Ken and Nick got in there and said, listen, Josh, we want you to fast from these sins. And so we're so serious about your mina, your salvation, that we're going to fast with you. And Josh says, well, what are you, what are you guys going to give up? Nick goes, well, I'm going to give up coffee. And for coffee drinkers, that's a major sacrifice. <laughs> and then it came Ken's turn. Ken, what are you going to give up? I'm going to give up eating after 9 p.m. <laughs> Now, if you get the midnight munchies, that's a major sacrifice as well. But I think the point was, is Josh understood that these men are pulling for me. They're in the battle with me. They're asking me, and I'm so thankful. How is it going today? You know, this sense of accountability got them to the waters of baptism. But, you know, if we're going to take each other to heaven, We've got to still have this daily accountability because we still are who we are. I had to chuckle a little bit with Josh. He, he, you know, he's very humbled by, by his sin. He says he has addictive personality. Let me tell you something. We all do in this room. It's just that we're addicted to different stuff. And we need to be open and honest about that. that that's who we are. And bottom line, one of the things that, that we try to do here in the congregation is to, to have the kind of relationship where people are really in our lives. It's not just surfacy, not just, you know, hang around the fellowship 10 minutes and then out. No, no, no. We believe, like the Bible teaches, that, that we're devoted to fellowship. We're involved in each other's lives. And so in the congregation right here, we have discipleship partners. Where we have brothers with brothers who, who get in there and share what's going on in their lives, but ask the tough questions. Same thing with the sisters with the sisters. They ask, hey, how's the quiet time coming? Are, 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 you, really, are you getting inspired by God? Pastor, what, are you, what are you studying in the Bible? Oh, you, you don't really? Okay, let me help you with some stuff. Hey, how's the evangelism coming? I noticed you haven't had anybody Bible talk for a month. Oh, is there something wrong? Bro, how's the marriage coming? Now, if you're a brother and you're a, a couple's D time, never answer that question first. Let the wife go first. Because a lot of times the brother goes, oh, it's going great. Then the wife goes, I'm so terrible. I'm doing it. I just. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was a hint from an old guy who blew it a few times. But so, you know, we believe in, in, in the congregation here to keep things confidential. But you also got to talk about tough stuff. Say, bro, sis, how's the romance coming? I mean, we're, we're, you're having sexual relations. That's, that's what we're talking about. I mean, there's nothing off limits for disciples, guys. Because, you know, that's what makes a lot of guys struggle. That's what makes a lot of sisters struggle. Bro, how the family Devo's coming? How, how they doing? What did you do this week? You didn't have any, bro. You know, there comes a time when you have to correct, but there's also a time to rebuke. See, this is how we change each other's lives. You don't change each other's lives just by hanging around. You got to get into each other's life. And then maybe toughest of all, bro, how the finance is coming. How the finance is coming. You know, as Elaine and me, we've got... The people that disciple us, we're so thankful the Unsalons are here. They can help out. <laughs> Plenty of discipling to do. But, you know, they know where we stand financially, and that's important. Because if there's anything that can crush people spiritually, it's when you're not in good standing financially. 
I think the other thing that we, we sometimes neglect is the fact that even in our giving, if you're not setting aside on the first day of the week for the contribution, the Lord is going to discipline you on that. It's not just something the church asks you to do. And so when someone's not being blessed, one of the things I talk to them is I say, bro, how's the financial giving coming? And you'd be surprised how many times people have held back from the Lord. You know, right now we have a bit of a challenge. We're so thankful that the, the Holy Spirit took out the New York mission team. Amen, guys? And we're thankful about the Hawaii team leaving. That, and that's awesome. But that, that totals about 30 disciples that left us. And we still have the same bills. We still have the same bills. And so one of the things, and, and we're a baby church, but one of the things I think we've got to start maturing in right now is that as disciples, when we lay out what our tithe is, we're faithful every week. If by chance you forget your checkbook or something, you just double up the next week. Or if you're away, you make sure you give it when you return. But the bottom line is we've got to understand this isn't just Lou Jack's church or Elena's church. This is all of our church. Amen, guys? And we want to make it glorious. And, and, and I think we've got to understand here, guys, if you don't have these kind of relations where probing questions are asked, the darkness will come in there and your flesh will take over. And you will eventually fall away. It shocks me with churches that have gone away from discipling, how many divorces there are. There was, there was a day where I could get up and boast, except for, except for a couple isolated instances of adultery all around the world. There have never been a divorce in our fellowship. And now we have former ministers getting divorced. What's the issue? No discipling. People are not in each other's lives. Let me tell you something. The Bible talks about the fact that reckoning will come. You need discipling. You need people in your life. Don't, just, don't fight it. Volunteer. Get it out there. Even like our young brother did before. He was baptized. Amen? Let's get to the end of the parable itself. Jesus is talking to the crowd that's there, and he says, hey, take his mind away and give it to the other guy that has ten. And, and, and they go, well, sir, he already has ten. And in verse 26, he says, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But to the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who do not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Our fourth and last point, killed or commended. Killed or commended. In actuality, if you look carefully, there are three groups here. The servants, their number is ten. Ten is a perfect number. So they're given salvation. Each one of them is given a mina and said to put it to work. Now, within that ten, we find that some are faithful with the mina and multiply it. They're commended. But the servant, in other words, a guy that had salvation, who didn't apply his mina, and out of gratefulness worked to get other minas, other salvations, he's condemned. Everything is taken away from him. He is rejected by God. Yes, you can lose your salvation. The third group is the delegation. Remember the delegation that went and tried to stop the nobleman from becoming king? Well, the delegation represents the world. He says in verse 27, but those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Salvation is a very serious issue. And we need to understand, those are the three responses. Number one, you never respond. You never study the Bible. You never get baptized. You will be condemned. There are some that study the Bible. They get baptized. They're all fired up. But they don't, in response to grace, work for the Lord. And they fall away. And they are condemned. But those that apply their mind and live for other people, who have that sense of fascination about their salvation, so much so that they want other people to have it, these then, these few, stand commended before God. Now, we're going to finish out the rest of the chapter right here with remembering this particular parable now. Verse 28. 
after Jesus said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. So we're gonna, just about finishing the journey right here. As he approached Bethpage of Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one's ever ridden. Untie it, bring it here. If anyone asks why you're untying it, tell them the Lord needs it. Now, Luke goes into this much detail to let us know that Jesus knows exactly what's happening to him. And yet Jesus is totally at peace. We also see the sense of purity right here. He says, you need to find a colt that's never been ridden before. Keep going, verse 32. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came to the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they'd seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. This is what we know as a triumphal entry. The denominational world calls it Palm Sunday. You know, it's very interesting. This whole section is, is just filled with Old Testament scriptures and references. Turn, if you will, to Zechariah chapter 9. In verse 9, here's a prophecy that you're seeing fulfilled in this passage. Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Wow. That passage was being fulfilled as the people lined the road to Jerusalem. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't it have been something? I don't know about you, but I mean, the, the, the crowd at the Jubilee was amazing, was it not? I mean, the sense of joy, the singing, I mean, it was, it was awesome, the, just the sense that God was with it. I kind of picture that same sense of joy with all the people lining the road down to Jerusalem. People going, they're taking off their cloaks, they're taking blankets, and they're just throwing it down in front of Jesus and the donkey right there. And they're fired up. And they're saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the earth. And then the Pharisees, representing the Jewish leadership, says, Jesus, rebuke your disciples. This is improper. And Jesus lays out, I'll tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Creation itself declares that Jesus is the king. The people didn't know what kind of king he was to be. Even his disciples didn't know what kind of king he was to be. But make no mistake about it. Jesus knew he was the king, the Messiah, and he wanted that known to all the others. You know, with all these passages, it's very clear now that this whole scene, this, this entry into Jerusalem is by divine design. Not by chance at all. The fulfilling of all these scriptures. Jesus coming to the city of David, to Zion. This is it. This is the climactic moment of all history to this point. You know, I wonder if we really fully appreciate what we see here in this passage. What's really going on. The Son of God is getting ready to go to Jerusalem for the salvation of the entire world. Let's finish this up. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you didn't recognize the time of God's coming to you. Jesus is referencing right here, 70 AD, when Titus sacked the temple 
in fact, all of Jerusalem. What it symbolized for God, for Jesus, and for the Jewish people was the end of the physical nation of Israel as they knew it. It was the final judgment of God. Jesus knew it was coming. And so in the midst of this incredible, joyful praising of God, all these people just shouting Hosanna in the highest, Jesus comes over the ridge of the Mount of Olives, and he sees the city of Jerusalem knowing what's going to happen. And he cries. He weeps. Not for himself. He knew it was going to happen to him. He was crying for them. He was crying for everybody that would not respond. Wow. That's our God. He cries for everybody. And he knows their name. And he's about to offer his life for yours. The time of God's coming. For those of us that are disciples in the room right here, we knew it when it came, didn't we? Some of us really weren't looking for the kingdom when it came. Just came, oh, wow, I got invited to church. Wow, this is pretty cool. Yeah, I'll study. I don't know anything about the Bible, but man, this is a good church. Others, I've been looking for a church. I've been looking and looking and looking. I haven't been able to find I found it. Either way whether by searching or by surprise, you knew the time of God's coming. And it's something that I've seen, and perhaps you've seen it too, is there's, I believe that people are open, not perpetually, but have portals of openness. They come, they hear, and they're open. That's why as disciples, when someone shows interest, it's time to go. It's time to move. It's time to share the salvation that you've got. Because if you wait too long, the porthole might close. And they would miss the time of God's coming. Because you fail to recognize it. When you meet people, it is the time of God's coming. You are not an accident of God. You are the very church of Christ. And the people that you meet are the ones that God is sending you in to their lives so they can have salvation. If you dare remain silent, they will not know the time of God's coming. You know, this, this jubilee was incredible. Uh, I mean, every aspect of it was just amazing. And yet it was kind of interesting to me is that I, I felt that for, for some brothers and sisters, they understood it, but they didn't get it. As much as sometimes we lose our fascination with our salvation, we sometimes don't really understand the concept of the time of God's coming. You know, we talk very definitively that God has started a movement. This is not a thing of man. This is of God. And, and, and who are we if God would choose us? I mean, remember, who's in the kingdom? Sinners, tax collectors, and prostitutes. Here we are, guys. Now, doesn't it make the kingdom all the more glorious? To think that here we are, Sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes. And we share in it. And we're a part of the time of God's coming. Wow. Does that blow you away? That's, that's what the Lord is allowing you to participate in. That's why Samir travels 120 miles just to come to church from Palm Springs. Yet there are a lot of little church buildings on the way. And there's some that meet later than 10 o'clock. You have to sleep in. But you see, he understands 
baton of God's coming. The entourage. This is a couple we do love dearly. They were great shepherds for the church and for Elena and myself up in Portland. And we said, man, we need help. So much is happening. We need you guys. And I, I'll never forget them placing membership. Therese comes on up and says, oh, it's just so good to be here. And I'm so tired. This is awesome. This is great. I miss you guys. I love you guys. Tony gets up there. I'm here to work. <laughs> See, that's a couple that understands the time of God's coming. I think about our Raul and Linda. They were in Santiago, Chile, and they took a stand for God. And their stand for God put them in the shame of many of the people that they loved and cherish. But they said, listen, I must obey God rather than men. Truth must prevail over relationship. You know how it is. We study with people. And sometimes people are going to a pretty wicked church, but then when they see God's plan of salvation, that you got to have faith, you got to repent, you got to be a disciple, and then you got to be water baptized to have your sins forgiven. And they go, man, I just feel confused. I like both groups. I always go, listen, don't, don't worry about who is right. Be concerned, first of all, with what is right. Once you decide what is right, then you can decide who is right and where you need to go to church. How true it is even for us as disciples. Some don't really have their heart fully behind a new movement. And I'm scared you're going to miss the time of God's coming. The, the amazingness of it. There are qualms. There are quiet reservations. You, you need to look at the Bible. You need to get some convictions that it takes a movement to evangelize the world. And autonomous churches will not get the job done. And you need to say, listen, God, thank you for letting me a part of the time of your coming. Yes, this morning, New York had church. D.C. had church. Phoenix had church. I hope Kyle and them have church in a few hours out there in Hawaii. But, but you already see it happening. You already know it's happening. And, and wasn't it amazing that all of us, we come from so many different places, and there was a sense of unity and like-mindedness and like-spiritedness and like-heartedness that was just utterly amazing? People you've never met before. You go, man, I can just see it. That's God. And that's what it needs to be like. In every nation, and in every city, and in every town, in the entire world. Amen. What's the challenge? That's real simple. Number one, W, wondrous gift. Number two, ongoing challenge, O. Number three, reckoning will come, R. Number four, killed or commended, K. The challenge is to work. Not for our salvation but because of our salvation and because now is the time of God's coming. Thank you. God bless.